Falje Rash Quig Radio Public Tonic Socially, a Dunamako Bolio Clear, Erin Claren you, Begamage a coin for an Avertava Tokin Erin, August and Glosh Tok Public Tonic. Welcome to Irish Social Public and Radio, going out from Dublin. Today's broadcast marks always a month of broadcasting by Irish Social Public and Radio, our first significant milestone. We are proud to be taking an unashamedly social Republican position to many thousands of listeners around the world, either on Facebook, on YouTube and on sunsetradio.ie. Now on the show we have a new segment, Social Republican News, giving listeners an update on the situation in Ireland with a social Republican analysis. Next Tuesday, Harry Windsor, the stealth-style Baron of Kilkeel, will arrive in Dublin on an official visit. The Free State elite intend to roll out the red carpet for the English Royal and facilitate his visit with a massive security operation costing the taxpayer millions. This will significantly disrupt the lives of Dubliners. Harry is a murderer and is set to visit Trinity College, the Guinness Storehouse, Croke Park, in particularly insensitive move, Windsor will also visit a genocide memorial and museum in Dublin. This is a genocide, let's not forget, the liberty implemented by his family and government. Irish Social Republicans are organising a protest against the English Royal visit and we will have more on this story next week. In another blow against British normalisation strategy in Ireland, it has been announced that the Free State Police believe that Drew Harris, the British agent appointed as their commissioner, will need 24-hour armed guard when he takes over the job in September. This flag clearly demonstrates that there is nothing normal about the ongoing British occupation of the six counties. And despite their claims, to the contrary, both the Free State and British imperialism recognise this. Since the appointment of Drew Harris as the RIC's commissioner, there has been widespread condemnation of the appointment from victims of British war crimes in Ireland, and a number of groups have come out and stated that Drew Harris has personally prevented the release of legal files and has been personally involved in the cover-up of Britain's war crimes in Ireland. It's been widely reported too that Drew Harris has very close links to Britain's MI5 and it is our opinion that his appointment demonstrates the continuing subservience of the Free State to British imperialism. Irish Water and the Free State Government are attempting to use the current heat wave to raise the idea once again for a domestic water tax. Hiding behind the idea of conservation and a hosepipe ban, the Free State has attempted to blame the people of Ireland for the current water shortages, real or imagined. However, a number of experts have now come out and confirmed that a total of 57% of the Free State's water supply is lost through leaking or broken pipes. If the Free State was serious about conservation, it would be fixing these broken pipes and infrastructure, but it isn't. Instead, it is motivated by a profiteering greed and an ideological compulsion to privatise our domestic water supply. In related news, Irish Social Republicans this week added in Kilkill County Wicklow to prevent the installation of subcontractors from installing boundary boxes outside homes. We call on all water wires to be very vigilant in the coming weeks and months to ensure that boundary boxes are not being installed. And in a related story, young people in Fingless had recently built a swimming pool to cool off from the heat wave. However, this swimming pool was smashed up by the state implementing its housepipe ban while at the same time the OPW were down in the Phoenix Park using gallons of water to clean off the papal cross. This is a class issue and it must be fought as such. This week also saw the return of sectarian loyalist marching season in the occupied six counties. Already residents of the Short Strand have been barricaded into their homes and streets by British occupation forces to facilitate a code trailing march by the fascist Orange Order. The Orange Order, as it should be remembered, only allows members of a certain religion and its membership is inextricably linked to Britain's death squads in Ireland. The the irony in all this, of course, is that the climax of the marching season on the 12th of July celebrates the victory of William of Orange and the Pope over the forces of King James of England and King Louis of France. Irish Social Republicans call on the Irish working class, regardless of religion or race, to reject sectarianism and unite to re-establish their social republic. Irish Social Republican Radio sends our solidarity to these communities affected by sectarian martyrs and we will keep our listeners informed and updated of events throughout the loyalist marching season. There has been a welcome rise in workers' militancy in recent weeks and workers in a number of areas have taken direct action for their rights, going on strike. Workers at Lloyd's Pharmacy are currently staging 
weekly strike action over a company's refusal to recognise their trade union mandate. Workers are also demanding an end to zero-hour contracts, the introduction of sick pay and better fairer wages. The next strike action takes place Friday, July 6th, so if there's a live farmers in your area, get down and support the workers. Workers at TK Max in Arklow, County Wicklow, have also decided to take strike action on this Saturday, July 7th. Workers are demanding an end to insecure hours of bad rostering practices along with fairer wages. Workers who voted for strike action at TK Max have done so because the company have refused to recognise a Labour Court ruling in relation to their demands and have bizarrely offered the workers two goldfish allegedly in an attempt to improve relations. So if you're in Arklow this Saturday, drop by and so- show support for the workers' resistance. Cabin crew at Ryanair have also published a-, a charter and a list of demands including an end to agency work and fairer wages, while pilots are also have voted for a strike this coming Thursday. We at Irish Social Public and Radio support all the workers in these demands and hope to see a continuing increase in workers' militancy. And finally, this week in Social Republican News, uniformed US imperialists were pictured at a garage close to Shannon Warport, while a US warplane was pictured on the runway under the armed guard of the Free State and Military Police. This event highlights the continuing use of Shannon Airport as a forward tactical base by US imperialism and NATO. There is an almost media blackout on this reality in the Free State. Shannon Airport is used on an almost daily basis to ferry US terrorists and munitions to its wars of conquest around the world against the express wishes of the Irish people who want no part in imperialist wars. This event, like Britain's ongoing strategy of normalisation, demonstrates how the Free State is completely subservient to international imperialism. We here at Irish Social Public and Radio demands that US imperialists get out of Shannon Airport and Ireland now. Now this week Irish Social Republicans have launched a new campaign demanding the renaming of Irish streets called after British imperialists. Activists took direct action to launch the campaign by painting out the road signs at Victoria Road in Killiney, a road named after England's genocide queen. The following is a statement from Irish Social Republicans about the initiative that has been covered in a number of media outlets. Direct Action Against Colonialism Irish Social Republicans have staged a direct action against colonialism by painting out the names of Dublin streets named after British imperialists. As the photos below show, the group launched its campaign with an action against Victoria Road in Colony, a road named after England's infamous genocide queen. A spokesperson for the group stated, Britain continues to illegally occupy six Irish counties, yet there are streets across the country named after and therefore glorifying the actions of British imperialists in Ireland. Our campaign is about highlighting this and encouraging people to take similar actions themselves. Such actions are a small but symbolic way to contribute to the ongoing anti-colonial resistance in Ireland. The spokesperson continued, We have launched this campaign here at Victoria Road in Colony as there is no justifiable argument as to why a road in Ireland should be called after England's genocide queen who presided over a deliberate policy of ethnic cleansing in Ireland from 1845 to 1852. By painting out these road signs we are stating that the ongoing British occupation of our country is unacceptable and that the glorification of the crimes of British imperialism in Ireland will not be tolerated. In the coming weeks, we will be building a campaign to reach every street in the country that is named after a British imperialist. The statement ends. This is a campaign that we at Irish Social Public and Radio fully support and we will be bringing you updates as it grows and develops. We'd also like to encourage you that if there is a British imperialist street in your area, a street named after a British imperialist that is, why don't you black out the names and send the pictures in to anti-imperialist action on Facebook. And finally on today's show, we are launching a new educational feature with readings from the works of great revolutionaries, both Irish and international. First up, we'll be recording weekly readings from James Conley's masterpiece, Labour in Irish History. And today, we begin with the foreword to that text. Labour in Irish History by James Conley. In her great work, The Making of Ireland and Its Undoing, the only contribution to Irish history we know of, which conforms to the methods of modern historical science, 
the authoress, Mrs. Stafford Green, dealing with the effect upon Ireland of the dispersion of the Irish race in the time of Henry VIII and Elizabeth, and the consequent destruction of Gaelic culture and rupture with Gaelic tradition and law, says that the Irishmen educated in schools abroad abandoned or knew nothing of the lore of ancient Erin, and had no sympathy with the spirit of the Brehan Code, nor with the social order of which it was juridical expression. She says they urged the theory so antagonistic to the immemorial law of Ireland that only from the polluted sinks of heretics could come the idea that the people might elect a ruler and confer supreme authority on whomever so pleased them. In other words, the new Irish, educated in foreign standards, had adopted as their own the feudal capitalist system of which England was the exponent in Ireland and urged it upon the Gaelic Irish. As the dispersion of the clans, consummated by Cromwell, finally completed the ruin of Gaelic Ireland, all the higher education of Irishmen henceforth ran in this foreign groove and was coloured with this foreign colouring. In other words, the Gaelic culture of the Irish chieftainry was rudely broken off in the 17th century and the continental schools of European despots implanted in its place in the minds of the Irish students and sent them back to Ireland to preach a fanatical belief in royal and feudal prerogatives, as foreign to the genius of the Gael as was the English ruler to Irish soil. What a light this sheds upon Irish history of the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, and what a commentary it is upon the real origin of that so-called Irish veneration for the aristocracy, of which the bourgeois charlatans of Irish literature write so elegantly. That veneration is seen to be as much as of an exotic, as much of an importation as the aristocratic caste it venerated. Both were foul foreign blossoms blown hither to poison our plains. But so deeply has this insidious lie about the aristocratic tendencies of the Irish taken root in Irish thought that it will take a long time to eradicate it from the minds of the people or to make the Irish realise that the whole concept of orthodox Irish history for the last 200 years was a betrayal and abandonment of the Irish best traditions of the Irish race. Yet such is undoubtedly the case. Let us examine this a little more closely. Just as it is true that a stream cannot rise above its source, so it is true that a national literature cannot rise above the moral level of the social conditions of the people from whom it derives its inspiration. If we would understand the national literature of a people, we must study their social and political status, keeping in mind the fact that their writers were a product thereof, and that the children of their brains were conceived and brought forth in certain historical conditions. Ireland, at the same time, as she lost her ancient social system, also lost her language as the vehicle of thought and of those who acted as her leaders. As a result of this twofold loss, the nation suffered socially, nationally and intellectually from a prolonged arrested development. During the closing years of the 17th century, all the 18th and the greater parts of the 19th, the Irish people were the lowest helots in Europe, socially and politically. The Irish peasant, reduced from the position of a free clansman, owning his tribe lands and controlling its administration in common with his fellows, was a mere tenant at will, subject to eviction, dishonour and outrage at the hands of an irresponsible private proprietor. Politically he was non-existent, legally he held no rights, intellectually he sank under the weight of a social abasement and surrendered to the downward drag of his poverty. He had been conquered and he suffered all the terrible consequences of defeat at the hands of a ruling class and nation who had always acted upon the old Roman maxim of woe to the vanquished. To add to his humiliation, those of his name and race who would contrive to escape the general ruin and sent their children to be educated in foreign schools, discovered with the return of those wild geese to their native habitat that they who would sail for France, Italy or Spain, filled with hatred of the English crown and of the English landlord garrison in Ireland, returned as mere Catholic adherents of a pretender to the English throne, using all the prestige of their foreign schooling to discredit the Gaelic ideas of equality and democracy, and instead of distilling into the minds of the growing generations feudal ideas of the divine rights of kings to rule and of subjects to unquestionably obey. The Irish students in the universities of the continent 
were the first products of a scheme which the papacy still pursues with its unaccustomed skill and persistence, a persistence which wrecks little of the passing centuries, a scheme which looks upon Catholic Ireland simply as a tool to be used for the spiritual reconquest of England to Catholicity. In the 18th century, this scheme did its deadliest work in Ireland. It failed ridiculously to cause a single Irish worker in town or country to strike a blow for the Stuart cause in the years of the Scottish Rebellion of 1715 and 1745, but it prevented them from striking any blows for their own cause or from taking advantage of the civil feuds of their enemies. It did more. It killed Gaelic Ireland, an Irish-speaking Catholic, was of no value as a missionary of Catholicism in England, and an Irish peasant who treasured the tongue of his fathers might also have reverence for the principles of the social policy and civilization under which his forefathers had lived and prospered for unnumbered years. And such principles were even more distasteful to French, Spanish or Papal patrons of Irish schools of learning on the continent than they were to English monarchs. Thus, the poor Irish were not only pariahs in the social system of their day, but they were also precluded from hoping for survival of intellectual life through the achievements of their children. Their children were taught to despise the language and traditions of their fathers. It was at or during this period when the Irish peasant had been crushed to the very lowest point, when the most he could hope for was to be pitied as animals are pitied. It was during this period Irish literature in English was born. Such Irish literature was not written for Irishmen as a real Irish literature would be. It was written by Irishmen about Irishmen but for English or Anglo-Irish consumption. Hence the Irishman in English literature may be said to have been born with an apology in his mouth. His creators knew nothing of the free and independent Irishman of Gaelic Ireland but they did know the conquered, robbed, slave-driven, brutalised, demoralised Irishman the product of generations of landlord and capitalist rule, and him they seized upon, held up to the gaze of the world, and asked the nations to accept as the true Irish type. If he crouched before a representative of royalty, with a subject submission born of a hundred years of political outlawry and training in foreign ideas, his abasement was pointed to proudly as an instant of the ancient Celtic fidelity to hereditary monarchs. If with the memory of perennial famines, evictions, jails, hangings and tenancy at will be clouding his brain, he humbled upon himself before the upper class or attached himself like a dog to their personal fortunes. His sycophancy was cited as a manifestation of ancient Irish veneration for the aristocracy and if long continued insecurity of life begot in him a fierce desire for the ownership of a piece of land to safeguard his loved ones in a system where land was life, this newborn land hunger was triumphantly trumpeted forth as a proof of the Irish attachment to the principle of private property. Be it understood, we are not talking now of the English slanderers of the Irishman, but of his Irish apologists. The English slanderer never did as much harm as did these self-constituted delineators of Irish characteristics. The English slanderer lowered Irishmen in the eyes of the world, but his Irish middle-class teachers and writers lowered him in his own eyes by extolling as an Irish virtue every sycophantic voice begotten of generations of slavery. Accordingly, as an Irishman, peasant, labourer, or artisan banded himself with his fellows to strike back at their oppressors in defence of their right to live in the land of their fathers, the respectable classes who had embodied their foreign ideas publicly deplored his act and unctuously ascribed to it the evil effects of English misgovernment upon the Irish character. But when an occasional Irishman abandoned all the traditions of his race, climbed up upon the backs of his fellows to wealth or position, his career was held up as an example of what an Irishman could do under congenial or favourable circumstances. The 17th, 18th and 19th centuries were indeed the Via Dolorosa of the Irish race. In them, the Irish Gael sank out of sight, and in this place the middle class politicians, capitalists and ecclesiastics laboured to produce a hybrid Irishman, assimilating a social foreign system, a foreign speech and a foreign character. In the effort to assimilate the first two, the Irish were unhappily too successful, 
so successful that today the majority of the Irish do not know that their fathers ever knew another system of ownership and the Irish Irelanders are painfully grappling with their mother tongue with the hesitating accent of a foreigner. Fortunately, the Irish character has proven too difficult to press into respectable foreign moulds and the recoil of that character from the deadly embrace of capitalist English conventionalism as it has already led to a re-evaluation of the speech of the Gael will in all probability also lead to a restudy and appreciation of the social system under which the Gael reached the highest point of civilization and culture in Europe. In the reconversion of Ireland to the Gaelic principle of common ownership by a people of the resources of food and maintenance, the worst obstacle to overcome would be the opposition of the men and women who have embodied their ideas of Irish character and history from Anglo-Irish literature. That literature, as we have explained, was born in the worst agonies of the slavery of a race. It bears all the birthmarks of such origin upon it. But irony of ironies, these birthmarks of slavery are hailed by our teachers as the native characteristics of the Celt. One of these slave birthmarks is the belief in the capitalist system of society. The Irishman frees himself from such a mark of slavery when he realises the truth that the capitalist system is the most foreign thing in Ireland. Hence, we have had in Ireland for over 250 years the remarkable phenomenon of Irishmen of the upper middle classes urging upon the Irish toilers as a sacred national and religious duty the necessity of maintaining a social order against which their Gaelic forefathers had struggled despite prison cells, famine and the sword for over 400 years. Reversing the procedure of the Normans settled in Ireland they were said to have become more Irish than the Irish. The Irish proprietor classes became more English than the English and so have continued to our day. Hence we believe that this book, attempting to depict the attitude of the dispossessed masses of the Irish people in the great crisis of modern Irish history, may justly be looked upon as part of the literature of the Gaelic revival. As the Gaelic language scorned by the possessing classes sought and found its last fortress in the hearts and homes of the lower orders, the reissue from hence in our own time to what the writer believes to be a greater and more enduring place in civilization than of old. So in the words of Thomas Francis Marr, the same wretched cabins have been the holy shrines in which the traditions and hopes of Ireland have been treasured and transmitted. The apostate patriotism of the Irish capitalist class, arising as it does upon the rupture with Gaelic tradition, will of course reject this conception and saturated with foreignism themselves, they will continue to hurl the epithet of foreign ideas against the militant Irish democracy. But the present Celtic revival in Ireland, leading as it must to reconsideration and more analytical study of the laws and social study, social structure of Ireland before the English invasion, amongst its other good results, will have this one also, that it will conform and establish the truth of this conception. Hitherto the study of the social structure of Ireland in the past has been marred by one great fault, for a description and interpretation of Irish social life and customs, the student depended entirely upon the description and interpretation of men who were entirely lacking in knowledge of and insight into the facts and spirits of the things they attempted to describe. Imbued with the conception of feudalistic or capitalistic social order, the writers perpetually strove to explain Irish institutions in terms of an order of things to which those institutions were entirely alien. Irish titles, indicative of the function in society preferred by their bearers, the writers explained by what they supposed were anagalous titles in the feudal order of England, forgetful of the fact as the one form of society was the antithesis of the other and not its counterpart. The one set of titles could not possibly convey the same meaning as the other, much less a translation. Much the same mistake was made in America by the early Spanish conquistadors in attempting to describe the social and political systems of Mexico and Peru, with much the same results of introducing almost endless confusion into every attempt to comprehend life as it actually existed in those countries before the conquest. The Spanish writers could not mentally raise themselves out of the social structure of continental Europe, and hence their weird and wonderful tales of despotic Peruvian and Mexican emperors and nobles, where really existed the elaborately organised family system of a people 
not yet fully evolved into a political state. Not until the publication of Morgan's monumental work on ancient society was the key to the study of American native civilization really found and placed in the hands of the student. The same key will yet unlock the doors which guard the secrets of our native Celtic civilization and make them possible of fuller comprehension for the multitude. Meanwhile, we desire to place before our readers the two propositions upon which this book is founded, propositions which we believe embody alike the fruits of the experience of the past and the mature thought of the present upon the points under consideration. First, that in the evolution of civilization, the progress of the fight for national liberty of any subject nation must, perforce, keep pace with the progress of the struggle for liberty of the most subject class in that nation, and that the shifting of economic and political forces which accompanies the development of the system of capitalist society leads inevitably to the increasing conservation of the non-working class element and to the revolutionary vigour and power of the working class. Second, that the result of the long drawn out struggle of Ireland has been so far that the old chieftainry has disappeared, or through its degenerative descendants has made terms with iniquity and become part and parcel of the supporters of the established order. The middle class, growing up in the midst of the national struggle, and at one time, as in 1798, through the stress of the economic rivalry of England, almost forced into the position of revolutionary leaders against the despotism of their industrial competitors, have now also bowed the knee to ball and have a thousand economic strings in the shape of investments binding them to English capitalism as against every sentimental or historical attachment drawing them towards Irish patriotism. Only the Irish working class remain as the incorruptible inheritors of the fight for freedom in Ireland. To that unconquered Irish working class, this book is dedicated by one of their number, James Connolly.